I'm glad we can be together for class and as I've been saying over and over since I don't have students right here with me in the classroom we're still on the corona quarantine thing I've been urging you to have at hand a delicious artificially sweetened chemically laced carbonated beverage and uh, of course it doesn't have to be uh, carbonated or artificially sweetened that's just what I prefer but some of you have been messaging me or uh, making social media posts or whatever talking about whatever beverage you have at hand I'm going to refer to one of those posts here in a minute so I wanted to encourage you to let me know either in the comments below give me some feedback here on the uh, comment section in the comment section on the YouTube video here or you can uh, um, message me uh, you can send me a, a, a message through Facebook Messenger or text me or whatever the case might be and let me know what your beverage of choice is. I think that's kind of fun. And it lets me know who's watching. But uh, I've got right now this uh, Rockstar, sugar-free Rockstar Super Sours Green Apple. And it has 300 milligrams of caffeine, but it is every bit as disgusting as it sounds. I'm not going to get this flavor again. Now, the reason I'm in the dark, I have the lights out here, so I could show you uh, a post on Facebook that Ginny Perimba, Sister Ginny Perimba made. She was watching the program with her daughter, and she said, uh, uh, we're ready for class with our ice-cold, delicious non-carbonated drink so we could add ice cold if it's summer or piping hot I guess if it's cold uh, where you are at the time that you're that you're watching non-carbonated and so there it's a little bit hard to see that's why I have the lights up so there they have an image of the class on their computer screen or television screen and they're holding up their delicious drinks as I'm holding up mine there at the beginning of class so I thought that was pretty I thought that was pretty neat and wanted to encourage you to do that. Oops, starting the timer. Also, it's important for you to know, and I'll turn the lights on and we'll get rolling, trust me. It's important for you to know that Bluebell has a new ice cream out on the market. Confetti cake. Now I know not everybody watching this, there are people watching this like Ginny and her daughter Caitlin, they're in Ohio. Uh, we met them when they were members of the church in Virginia. I'm standing on some boxes here, and I just fell backwards. Um, but uh, it may be the case where you are that Bluebell is not available. I know it's not available everywhere in the country, and that is tragic. Really, it's, it's wrong. But those of you who have access to Bluebell, there's a new flavor out, and right now my grandkids happen to be visiting at the house. Yes, confetti cake, Bluebell. You know, those of you who know me know what a fan I am of Bluebell ice cream, the best ice cream in the country. There's Natalie and Easton, and you can see that Natalie has polished hers off really, really well there. Oh, look at the happy. Look at it. And then there, Easton is feeding me. I mean, sorry, little Lincoln. Little Lincoln is sharing his with me. I need to turn the light on now since I have nobody here to do that. Thank you for bearing with me, but just look at that. Look at that. Isn't, isn't he absolutely adorable? And Lincoln's cute, too, right? Okay. Now, let's look at the theme of salvation in Luke's gospel, and I'm going to try to rush through some of this. It's a lot of material. I have a lot of scripture references here, but I really need to pick up the pace or we're still going to be in Luke's gospel in the year 2026, 20, and uh, it's really time to, to get rolling here. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I always say that, and then I end up going into too much detail. Now, of course, we would expect salvation to be a theme of all the gospels. We would expect to see that, of course, since that's the theme of the whole Bible. Uh, the a whole idea of salvation is at the heart of the Christian faith, but it, it's... Worth noting that only Luke's gospel, it's the only synoptic that refers to Jesus as Savior when the angels in the uh, Gloria in Excelsis, the, uh, the angels to the shepherds say, uh, there is born unto you this day in the city of 
David, a Savior, Christ the Lord. That's, uh, that's uh, just before uh, all glory breaks out and they uh, give praise to God and they announce Jesus is the Savior. There's born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior. So he's explicitly called that. Only place in the synoptics. Now in John, in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in John 4, 42, refers to Jesus as the Savior. Uh, but here we have it emphasized in Luke's gospel that it's only in Luke's gospel, Luke 19 and verse 10, where we find that familiar statement that Jesus says, I came to seek and to save. I came to save the lost. And in uh, chapter 15, in the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son, we find several references to joy over uh, the lost being found. And Jesus speaks of the lost being saved, that he's, came, that he's come to save them. And so uh, what, in what ways and what other ways are we going to find salvation presented in a distinctive way? What's the Lucan theology of salvation? Well, it's, it's distinctive in this sense that it's not linked as directly to the cross or as explicitly to the cross as it is elsewhere in the, in the other Gospels. For example, Luke omits Mark's reference to uh, Jesus saying that he's come to give himself a ransom, as a ransom. And that, that clearly implies the idea that Jesus is paying a price in order to liberate, in order to make possible the redemption of souls. And so that has the idea of a substitutionary atonement or penal substitutionary atonement that hints at that right there. There's nothing though in Luke's gospel like Matthew's quote in Matthew 26, 28, where Jesus has the cup and he says, this is my cup of the new covenant that's poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And so for these and other reasons, you'll, sometimes you'll find scholars who think that Luke's gospel seems to present Jesus' death as more of an example of a pious martyr than suggesting that it's a matter of uh, atonement for sin. However, however, we know that's not the case. Jesus actually does save someone on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. It's interesting to notice that it's similar to when Jesus would forgive sins, extend forgiveness of sins, but there he guarantees that man that he's saving his soul, bringing him to paradise. Notice that Luke insists that Jesus' death is somehow necessary, necessary, that Jesus must suffer, must suffer. So in, in the divine plan and the grand scheme of things for salvation to be possible, it necessitated the suffering of the Savior. And Luke uses that language that we've already looked at. We pointed that out. And only Luke's gospel, only in Luke's gospel does Jesus apply Isaiah 53, that messianic, that text from Isaiah, the suffering servant of God, that obviously messianic text, there, Jesus applies that in Luke's gospel to himself in Acts 20, in Luke 22, 37, where he says that I will be numbered among the transgressors. And he's alluding there to uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 12. And then in Luke part two, you go over to Acts. In Acts chapter eight, when, the, the, um, when Philip comes to the Ethiopian nobleman and he's reading from Isaiah, he's reading from that text. He's reading from Isaiah 53, and he doesn't know to whom Isaiah was referring, and that's when Luke tells us that Philip took that same scripture and beginning from that scripture, preached unto him Jesus. So he's showing you that was about Jesus. Now, yes, Matthew does identify Jesus with Isaiah 53, but he does it with reference to Jesus' ministry. In Matthew 8, 17, he alludes to it. Uh, but uh, not, and also in, in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 17, verses 17 through 21, but, but not with reference to his death as you see in Luke's gospel. That's very interesting. And of course, Isaiah 53 is applied to uh, Jesus elsewhere in the New Testament, most notably in my mind, 1 Peter 2, 22 through 25, 
Uh, Romans 15, 21, Paul alludes to Isaiah 52, verse 15, which is part of that same context. Hebrews 9, 28 alludes to it as well. But Luke is the gospel where Jesus applies it to, him, to himself. Now, a central theme then of salvation in Luke Acts, we're saying salvation, that this is a dominant theme in Luke. Well, what is it saying about salvation? that it has now arrived, Luke is showing, that salvation has now arrived. The idea that it is now here, the, the time prophesied to bring the, the promised salvation that God has been prophesying, that the prophets have been foretelling, it's now arrived and it's available to all people everywhere. All people everywhere, not just Israel, but that it's coming through Israel to the whole world, to the Gentiles. And that's the way of saying that it's going out to everybody else, that it's going out to the whole world. So you see reference to the salvation of the Gentiles is especially noted in Luke Acts. Um, the other synoptics hint at the inclusion of the Gentiles or what we call what we would call the universality of the gospel. We, we covered that in Matthew. You have hints of it even at the beginning of Matthew's gospel in the genealogy. You have a couple hints of it along the way. And then at the end of his gospel, Jesus commissions the disciples in Matthew 28. What does he tell them? To go make disciples of all the nations, right? Not just Israel. However, it's not emphasized like it is in Luke. We find in John, God's concern is for the whole world. John 3, 16, so God so loved the world that who, whosoever, anyone who believes in him, should have eternal life, John 3, 36, and other passages as well. You find it referred to in the other Gospels, but it's not the major emphasis that you see in Luke Acts. That's what we, we want you, uh, that, that's what we want to make sure we take away from this. It's uniquely emphasized in Luke Acts, the universality of the Gospel, that salvation is for the world that it's for the Gentiles as well. Right at the beginning of Luke's gospel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through these passages quickly here. Because to be truthful with you, I already recorded this class and I didn't like it, so I just started over. So this is my second run through this because I want to get further into the material. I can't do that when everybody's here and class is live, uh, but doing it this way, uh, I've done this a few times. I didn't like the class. I just start over. But it's getting late. It's 11.15 p.m. Earlier than I'm usually recording, though. But here in Luke 2.32, in the Nunc Dimittis, where Simeon, notice what Simeon says here, that Jesus is going to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. Notice the Gentiles here. Whoops. The, the Gentiles are listed first. The Gentiles are listed first, interestingly, and then to the people of Israel, just a kind of a... Uh, a, a poetic way of putting it there. But then we see when um, at the end of Luke's gospel, let me just go back here so you can see a slide where I have all these passages here. At the end of Luke's gospel, Jesus said that you're to go preach repentance and remission of sins to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So it's going to start where God has centered his presence with his covenant people with Israel. See, the geography, you remember, is theology in Luke. He emphasizes Jerusalem. So it's going to be the place where they begin in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus repeats that, that it's going to start in Jerusalem and go to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. So it goes to the whole world. Uh, but uh, it, starting with God's covenant people under the Old Testament dispensation uh, with Israel. So it's going to start in Jerusalem to Israel first, then to the whole world. Well, so when we get to Acts chapter 2, when Luke continues the story and Peter is preaching for the first time in the name of the resurrected Lord, he's preaching the resurrection of Christ to the, to the people on the day of Pentecost. And when he quotes from Joel, it shall be in the last day. See, we've reached those days. Those days are now here. God declares, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, see, Jew and Gentile. And then when we continue a little bit further in what Peter is saying, what's the point of all that in verse 21? So that it will come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
everyone, all right? So then their response to Peter's preaching, when Peter tells them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then what does he say? For the promise, that idea of promise and fulfillment. We already looked at that in Luke's gospel. Promise, the promise is for you. It's for you, but for, for who else? And for your children and for all who are far off. For you and for your children. Everyone whom the Lord our God shall call. And Luke goes on to show how God calls people through the gospel. So notice, the promise is for all who are far off. That's the Gentiles. For everyone. For everyone. Again, a unique emphasis that we see in Luke's gospel. Then uh, later, when God sends Peter to Cornelius, and that's when the door of the church, as we often say, is open to the Gentiles. It, it, the first time we see uncircumcised Gentiles accepted on the terms of faith in Christ and responding to the gospel and not uh, having to be circumcised and brought under the law of Moses and all of that. So uh, when Peter, when the Lord's trying to get this across to Peter, and we, we find that this, excuse me, let me get this right here. I keep selecting the wrong thing, and thank you for bearing me. There we go. So it finally dawns upon Peter uh, that as he's speaking to Cornelius and his household, all that are gathered there on that occasion, he finally realizes that God shows no partiality, verse 34, in every nation, in every nation, Anyone in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now watch this, though, because he goes on. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. He's not just the Messiah of Israel. He's not just the Lord of Israel. He is Lord of all. And so that's what he preaches at at the household of Cornelius, they receive the Holy Spirit and they're baptized. And then uh, as, as Peter continued preaching again, he uh, says to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him, verse 43, uh, can receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And then when uh, uh, the Holy Spirit's poured on them and then they're baptized, Peter realizes they may uh, be accepted or when the Holy Spirit's poured out on them, Peter realizes they're to be accepted, and then they're baptized in water. Now, when the church, uh, sorry for stumbling over that so much. All right, we got it straight. So when the church in Jerusalem hears about this, and they contend with Peter that he went into the house of uh, one who was uncircumcised, and he ate with him. You had those who were very zealous for the law in the church, and they're called the party of the circumcision. So they criticize him, so Peter tells them what happened, and their conclusion about all this is down in verse 18. I like how it's worded. They heard these things, they fell silent. In other words, they, they stopped their criticism and they glorified God, then saying, what's the conclusion they reached about all that happened there with Peter and the household of Cornelius? Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance of life. It's to the Gentiles also. In other words, it is for the whole world and not just for Israel. When Paul's preaching later in Antioch of Pisidia, again, he cites the prophecy, I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's what we're told Jesus made possible, you see in Luke, and then you see it happening in Luke part two in the book of Acts as he continues the story, when Paul's before Agrippa, again, what does he say? Something very similar that, uh, look at the end of verse 23, again, a light, that Christ would be a light both to our people but to the Gentiles, that it started with Israel and through Israel goes to the whole world. And then again at the end, if I go back to these passages I listed for you, quite a few there, but you'll notice there at the end, Acts 28 and verse 28, you have at both the beginning of Luke's gospel and at the end of Luke's writing, at the end of this two-volume work, at the end of the book of Acts, another reference to the inclusion of the Gentiles. And so what does that make? You know if you've, if you've been in my class, you've got something there at the beginning and then something said again, the, the same thing said basically uh, said again at the end of the account when you have something that starts and ends with something, you have those bookends ends 
What, what did we say that is, of course? Yes, you know what it is. You're saying it right now. I know those who have been in my class, you're saying the word, right? Yes, it is. And inclusio. So there it is. Well, in Luke 155 there, it's in the Magnificat at the beginning that all this Mary links all this that's happening with Christ coming into the world to God keeping his promise to Abraham. Well, what was that promise? Genesis 12, 1 through 3, that through Abraham, through his seed, through his people, he would bless all the families of the earth. So you have an allusion to it there at the beginning of the gospel and also, as we said, with Simeon in Luke 2.32, there in the birth narrative right at the start and then at the end when Luke finishes up, what does Paul say on the, one of the very last things in Luke's gospel, Acts, or in Luke's account, in Acts 28.28, 28, Paul tells the Jews who came to him when he was under house arrest in Rome, this salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. So notice how it's all framed like that there. So you have many references like that. The fact that he dates uh, the gospel, he dates Christ coming into the world with Roman history. That's unique to Luke's gospel. Matthew doesn't care about that. You don't find it in Mark or John, but Luke is the one that wants to tell us exactly when to pinpoint this in uh, Roman history to show that Jesus is stepping into the world, not just in Israel's history, but in the history, in the in, in the, into the middle of time, as it were, into all of history, into world history, because this gospel is going to be for the whole world. But I think what's especially noteworthy of all the passages we might cite, I think this one really stands out, where we see how Luke cites a passage that Matthew and Mark do as well in a parallel account, but he gives a fuller citation than they do to emphasize this point. And I've got it illustrated right here. Okay, on the left, the left column is Matthew's account of, what, uh, of John the Baptist. So that's Matthew 3. In the center is Mark's account, Mark 1. And then over here we've got uh, Luke chapter 3. So watch this now. Watch this. And uh, I want to make sure I can manipulate the text the way that I want to. Wait, let's go back to it. Um, all right, so in Matthew's account, and really I'm holding to the idea of Mark and priority, as those of you who have been taking the classes know, I believe Matthew and Luke use Mark. I really should have put Mark first over there. Well, in Mark's account there in the middle, what do you, what do you see? Mark is referring to John, and he cites from Isaiah 40 and verse 5. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and here's the quote, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And there's Matthew quoting it. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's all they say. Well, over here in Luke's account, you find that. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. But he continues the citation. And you might recognize some of this language from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech um, and other occasions when, when he used it. But here he continues the citation. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Here's a great example where you see the similarities in the parallel accounts in the synoptics, but then when you notice the differences where they depart from each other where you're seeing a special emphasis. This is included by Luke because this is something Luke really wants to highlight about Jesus' ministry. And so it would appear that Luke is familiar with the scriptures and has a copy uh, of the, at least the, uh, uh, the I would think the Pentateuch, uh, or rather the uh, Septuagint available to him. All right, so let's go back to our list of passages, make sure we, we got all that in. Yes, the extended quote from Isaiah. All right, we need to continue. So, uh, the universality of the gospel, you see it as well in what we're calling that paradigmatic, the paradigmatic passage from, uh, passage from Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 4, where he opens from the scroll of Isaiah the prophet, and he reads it in his hometown in the synagogue. And that's where he said, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, recovering a sight to the blind, liberty to them that are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. All right. So he cites that passage and he says, today that passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. Then they 
respond to what he says by trying to murder him. Well, why? What does he say? He says something that provokes them. He uses two Old Testament examples here that I'm just going to mention this quickly. When he said today in Luke chapter 4, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your ears, verse 21. Well, uh, notice that it's obvious they're expecting him to perform some signs there in his hometown like he had done elsewhere. And Jesus is explaining why he's not going to give them a sign. And so, um, even though at first they all marveled, verse 22, at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth, though, they said, well, this is, is, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know him? <laughs> I mean, how can he be the Messiah? So Jesus understands their skepticism, and he knows their unwillingness to embrace him. And he cites this, uh, verse 20, uh, 23, Doubtless you'll quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we've heard you do at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. So we've heard about the signs you already did, do them here. And Jesus is, is going to explain why he's not going to do them there for them at that time. So he said in verse 24, truly I say to you, a prophet's not acceptable in his hometown. So he's showing, you know, I, I, uh, I know you're not going to accept me. And that's been the pattern with God's prophets. And this is Luke's point, as we showed in the way that Luke uses Scripture and his promise and fulfillment motif and the way that he speaks of, in general, the way he shows Jesus speaking of how he in general fulfills the whole of the Old Testament narrative. And here's a great example where he uses two, uh, two instances in the narrative, in the story of Israel, to make a parallel with himself and what's happening to him. So notice he says in verse 25, uh, but in truth, I tell you, there are many widows in the days of Elijah. But he says, but Elijah didn't go to any of the ones that were in Israel. He went to uh, the widow of Seraphath, the, the one in Sidon, a widow in Sidon, outside of Israel. Then he gives another example. There are many leopards, verse 27, in Israel in the time of Elisha. But None of them was cleansed, but Naaman the Syrian. He went to the captain of the Syrian army. He gave him instructions, and God cleansed that man. All right, so they understand the point that he's getting at, that you had times when God didn't perform signs, even for his own people, but he still showed concern for people outside of Israel when his own people were not receptive. Well, they're insulted by the very idea. Even though Jesus is citing Scripture, they're insulted by the very idea and they rose up to kill him. So even in that key passage, in the broader context of it, we referred to it many times, that text from Luke 4, and how it sets out really the emphasis and the theme of Luke's gospel. But um, Jesus used the Old Testament narrative to show the Lord's concern for the Gentiles, for the Gentiles. So we're seeing that over and over. Now let's show how that concern goes on to uh, Luke in his gospel. We go on to see how that includes concern for the outsiders. God's gospel is for everyone. The, the salvation Christ comes to bring is for the whole world. And Luke emphasizes in a beautiful way. I think this is one of the most beautiful, one of the most touching, one of the most powerful, one of the most challenging. It really rebukes us, I think, in a lot of ways. But I think it's just one of the most appealing and powerful themes in Luke's gospel that is highlighted in a special way in Luke that you don't find it anywhere else. Else, concern for the outsiders, for those who are normally on the who are on the margins of society, who are normally who are often overlooked and not thought of uh, being included. And the way that Luke shows this concern now, as we move on to t to consider this theme, we're really expanding on what we've just said. That concern for the outsiders is often represented in the reference to the poor to the poor. But don't think of the poor strictly in economic uh, terms. There's a theological dimension to the way Luke refers to the poor. Uh, Luke's, when he shows compassion for the poor, it's showing, my point is, a broader concern for these categories, for the oppressed, for the excluded, 
for the marginalized, those on the fringes, for those who are disadvantaged, okay? Um, you see that in references like in, um, in Luke 14, 13, where Jesus says, when you have a feast, don't just invite those who will uh, and, and in turn invite you, that idea of reciprocity that so, was so prevalent in the culture of the day. But he says, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. References to those categories of people. To the lepers, of course, who were shunned, who had to be excluded from society uh, in, in a certain respect. Prostitutes, the sinful woman who comes and anoints Jesus with her tears in the household of Simon. There's reason to believe that the, the reference to prostitutes, to the sinful woman, when you see that kind of reference in Luke's gospel, that that may be referring to sex slaves. We think of those in terms of, we speak of those who are uh, trafficked in sexual slavery. So you, you have those included as well. That all typifies the oppressed whom Jesus came to liberate when he cites that prophecy in Luke chapter 4 from Isaiah. And, and he's alluding, he's quoting from Isaiah, and it's alluding to when he finishes and he says, I've come here to set at liberty those that are bruised, the, the, the release of the captives, this idea of being set free and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that this time is now here, the time of being set free, of the, the time of Jubilee. What the, what the year of Jubilee symbolized in Israel's history is now coming to pass. It's now being realized in Christ and in His ministry as you see His concern for these categories of people. That's what I want us to pay attention to. So think of the, how Luke's gospel will present the poor and the rich because Luke has more to say about when he shows us what Jesus says about discipleship, there's more teaching about money and the use of money in Luke's gospel than in, than in the other gospels. Now, I don't want to say poor versus the rich so much, but that think of the poor and the rich in these categories, as we said, the poor in Luke Luke in theology can symbolize those who are oppressed and marginalized and disadvantaged. Think of the humble or the godly of society. The, the Hebrew idea of the anayim, the Old Testament idea of the pious poor. Let me zoom in on that so you can see that a little bit better. Uh, because, uh, Rose, I know you want to make sure you've spelled the Hebrew term correctly. So there it is, the anagim, the plural uh, form right here, the pious poor, as they are sometimes referred to. And this is a category like we'll see in the Psalms when God's righteousness is being praised and we see his concern for the poor. We see his, uh, the, his concern for the, the poor as they cry out in their oppression. Think of Joseph and Mary in this respect, the sacrifice, whoops, I want to get back to where I was here. The sacrifice that they present uh, in, you see in chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, what the law required of uh, Jesus when he was an infant. They bring the birds that are an option when you make that sacrifice to comply with the law, and that suggests that they were uh, likely on, in the lower class. Whereas the rich now, and I say sometimes here, I'm qualifying it because we're speaking in generalities here. We need to be careful because we have a problem with overgeneralizing in our own culture, in the class warfare that is fomented so often in our day and that is very destructive to society. But notice, they often represent the powerful, the privileged, and, and those who are not interested in the gospel who are, are not pious, but not, that's not always the case. But it's interesting that, that Luke's gospel is the only one who presents the Pharisees, so they're in a privileged class, and they have power. They're lovers of money, see? And so they had a, this, this covetousness. But remember, bear in mind that this is, this is a simplistic idea. Bear in mind that Luke's depiction of the poor is more complex than that because there are rich who are righteous, there are poor, there can be poor who are sinful. We need to be careful with that. I just want to say a word here about that because it just so happens right now, if you're watching this way into the future, I don't know, the year 3251 or something, and look up in history, 
in the history of the United States, in 2020, this is the time right now over the last several days where there's been terrible rioting in the wake of the killing of George Floyd in police custody. He was killed in Minneapolis in police custody, and that police officer has been arrested and charged with third-degree murder. But there's been all, these, all this rioting, all this looting, burning of public property, destruction of businesses, the desecration of monuments and, and churches, and it's terrible synagogues. It's terrible, the violence and the just the pointless destruction that's going on right now. But a lot of times the rich are targeted in situations like this because the underclass, we have this idea, the underclass, they're the righteous ones who aren't getting what they deserve. And the rich, they're the ones who've exploited everyone and taken from everyone. And so they're the evil people. And you have politicians and a whole political class, the elite, who exploit that sort of envy for the rich and as I said, they stir up this kind of class envy where you get where you despise the rich as though they're the evil people in society. And you have this exaggerated idea of those who are of a lower class being the, the righteous. Well, that's not always the case as we're going to see because we do find that there are those who are wealthy who are righteous. And we, we can't overgeneralize here. We need to be careful. And you'll, you'll see that here uh, in a moment. But let's first look at um, how Luke does speak of the poor in contrast to the rich in Luke's account of the Beatitudes, for instance. You know the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew chapter 5? Well, in Luke's account, in Luke 6, the, 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 the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? That's how we usually hear it from Matthew's gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, in Luke's gospel, that's concretized. Um, it's not spiritualized as it is over there in Matthew's account. Matthew's account, bless, we pointed this out several times when we were looking at the uh, distinctiveness of the gospel accounts. But where in this account here, in Matthew's account, in Matthew 5 on the left, blessed are the poor in, blessed are the poor in spirit. Where over here in Luke, it's just blessed are the poor. And then over here in uh, Matthew's account, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So it's spiritualized. Over here in Luke's account, it's just blessed are you who are hungry. <laughs> it, it doesn't necessarily have to be for righteousness, but those who are simply hungry. And then in, in a counter distinction from the poor, only in Luke do you have then the woes that are pronounced upon the rich as you continue? Uh, what does he say? But woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. And so those woes are only in uh, Luke. You don't find that included uh, attacked on along with the Beatitudes in Matthew's gospel. He's constructed that Sermon on the Mountain from Jesus' teaching very carefully. It's a masterful, I think, uh, production uh, that accurately represents the heart of Jesus' teaching, but Luke just gives it to us like this. This is the emphasis he wants to make, and he includes those things that you don't see uh, uh, in the others. But I did want to make this caveat. This is really where I should have made it. I already did. Jesus is not teaching that poverty itself is a virtue. You can be uh, poor and go straight to hell uh, for being covetous, for uh, being ungodly. It's not a virtue in and of itself for refusing to respond to the gospel. And on the other hand, wealth is not necessarily a vice. Zacchaeus, where Jesus announces in a household that he has come to seek and save the lost, it's in the household of a tax collector of Zacchaeus. We're going to come to that uh, again later. Uh, so I want to save that. Abraham in Luke 16, in the account of the rich man and Lazarus, the poor man. See, there's another case of someone who's poor. Um, the poor man dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom. So he goes into paradise in Hades and he's with Abraham. Abraham was a rich man, a wealthy man. Joseph of Arimathea. Notice that he was a disciple of Jesus and he assists in the burial of Jesus. Jesus is buried in his tomb. And notice that it's in Luke's account 
Not in, you can compare that with Matthew, Matthew 27 and verse 57, but in Luke's account, chapter 23, verses 50 and 51, Luke is careful to tell us that he was a righteous man and he did not consent to what happened to Jesus and that he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the kingdom of God. All right, now I'm looking at my time. Yes, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. Let's do it. Let's, let's get to this. The concern that, that we're seeing in all of this, the concern that for the outsiders and those who are excluded and marginalized, you see that in a unique way in Luke's gospel in, in the portrayal of the Samaritans. The acceptance of victims of prejudice and bigotry and exclusion. Now that's why there are a lot of people in the streets right now. They're, they're protesting because of, uh, of a perception that there is a systemic abuse of minorities by those in power, that they're being excluded from the American dream and from uh, what the privileged of society are enjoying, and that this is uh, something that's being tolerated, the bigotry of, for example, the police, uh, the, that there's a prejudice that we're seeing there. Well, think when you think about all of that and those claims and concerns that are uh, being voiced right now in our culture, when you look at Luke's gospel, you see uh, the concern for, for people who uh, really were despised and were treated with contempt, who were excluded. You see... Uh, the acceptance of an emphasis on the Samaritans. Luke is the only one of the synoptics which shows concern for them. How so? Well, look at the case of the good Samaritan, the one who did the right thing, the one whom Jesus praised as truly showing love for his neighbor, the one that Jesus depicts in a positive light. It was the Samaritan. That's what makes that case so striking, that teaching so stunning. When Jesus heals 10 lepers, it's only a Samaritan who comes back to give glory to God when he thanks Jesus. It's a Samaritan who, who were so despised and hated. Then when the Samaritan, when they are going through a Samaritan village and, and the Samaritan showed prejudice or hostility toward the Jews. When, when they saw that Jesus and his disciples were headed to Jerusalem, they, they refused to accept them. They wouldn't give them accommodations. And that's when James and John said, do you want us to ask God to rain down fire on them? Lord, do you want us to, you want us to call in the big guns here and let's just, let's just scorched earth the, the Samaritans in this village. That's what James and John were asking. So even when the Samaritans behaved badly on that occasion, behaved poorly, uh, Jesus rebuked the hostility of his own disciples toward them. Now they were being the, uh, they were at that time being held in contempt by the Samaritans and they were also showing contempt for the Samaritans. But Jesus rebuked that. In other words, the, the prejudice that the Samaritans had toward them didn't justify being hostile toward the Samaritans. That's very important what you see there. And then, of course, we go on to see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said this gospel is to begin in Jerusalem and then go to all Judea and to Samaria. See, there's the bridge then until it finally goes to the uttermost parts of the earth. And, and Luke is careful to include... In the second volume of his work in Acts chapter 8, he talks about Philip bringing the gospel to Samaria, Samaria and how Philip went there and preached good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ that many believed and there was much joy in that city. So he shows us how uh, it went out to the, the, the Samaritans. But let me finish with this. The concern for the outsider we have to be careful how we categorize people here. And I think this is really quite timely, and I suppose it, it uh, always will be. But I can't help but think about some of the attitudes in our own culture and even in the church. Look, let's be careful here because the concern for the outsider and those who are excluded is shown in a surprising case, one that should, should really just strike us and hit us right here. All right, think about it with me. Let me build up to it. 
Now, Jesus was criticized in all the Gospels, in all the synoptics for associating with sinners, including the tax, the despised tax collectors, because the Jews who collected taxes for Rome, first of all, they were despised because they were working for the enemy, for the Romans who were occupying their country. And secondly, they typically would take more, this is how they earned their living, they'd take more from the people than Rome actually required so they could pocket the rest and make themselves rich. And so they were really hated. And that is referred to in Matthew and Mark, and I'm giving the references here. And you have the parallel in Luke. But Luke adds to, the, to that, those references Chapter 15, 1 and 2, there's another reference to how there's this objection to his association with tax collectors. And then he adds the, the fascinating account, in addition to what we already see in Mark and in the Q material that's only in Matthew and Luke, you see this case of the tax collector and the Pharisee who go down to the temple. And the Pharisee is self-righteous, and it's the tax collector who's humble and, and penitent and sees his need for God's mercy. It's the tax collector. So then we come to something unique to Luke's gospel as well, the case of the household of Zacchaeus. And this is at the end of Jesus, of the travel narrative. It really puts a powerful capstone on that long center section of Luke's gospel as Jesus is making his way toward Jerusalem. And he enters the house of a tax collector. And this causes, again, the same kind of murmuring and objections. And it's there in the household of Zacchaeus that he announces in verse 10, the son of, I'm, I'm here because the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Anyone who's lost. Even this tax collector. So, in other words, even though the tax collectors were considered part of the wealthy class, part of the privileged class, in Jesus' eyes... They could be outsiders as well. They could be those who uh, even, Jesus showed love, the point is, and concern for the well-being of their souls, even though many people might have thought of them as uh, not worthy of salvation, that they're worthy of our condemnation and nothing more. Uh, they, they were so despised, and yet, and yet, even people in positions of power and even people we might perceive of as privileged and, um, and, uh, and unworthy of our care and concern, even there, Jesus showed, Jesus showed uh, compassion. And so here's how I've said it. Uh, Jesus came for even the reviled and the ostracized rich. That, that, those can, can be included when you think of those uh, who are on the fringes or who are excluded, we should say, rather. Um, we need to be careful when we make judgments of people. Remember, there's a theology to the way Luke's referring to the poor. There's not an exact parallel in our day to the classes of the wealthy and the rich that you see in the ancient world. We, we have a society that, that in certain ways is structured much differently and in other ways is very similar in attitudes to what we find in Jesus day but notice the outcasts aren't always the poor and the powerless that Zacchaeus turns out to be a surprising case of Jesus inclusion of outsiders and you see the idea the humility you see his penitence he said I'll restore fivefold what I've exploited what I've taken uh, from others and I'm going to give half of my goods to take care of the poor, to take care of the poor. There it is again, reference to the poor. And that makes me think I totally skipped a chart where I had a whole list of uh, other references to the poor in Luke's gospel. I'll make sure it's in the file that I uploaded. I don't know why I'm, I'm not seeing it now. I might have accidentally deleted it, which will, which will really be a bad thing. But the point is, ultimately, the the concern for the outsider, the concern for those who are often overlooked, it's those who humble themselves before God who are going to receive. They're the poor who are going to be, uh, who are going to receive the wealth and the riches of the gospel, and which in Luke's, Luke's 
gospel and acts is forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so anyone who will humble himself before God, we should never overlook anyone. Jesus' concern is for everyone of every class. We're going to lead to that when we get to, there's one last category of excluded outsiders. That's redundant, but uh, I'm trying to emphasize it, and that is the concern for women that is uniquely highlighted in Luke's gospel. Uh, I'm not going to try to squeeze that in here and rush through it because it is a very important, I could have even listed this as its own separate theme among the other categories here, but I'm including it under the concern in Luke's gospel that you see on the marginalized. We'll look at uh, what he has to say about women in the place that they have in Jesus' ministry and in the work of God in the kingdom of God. It's really, you see why I say this is such a beautiful, beautiful thing that we, that we see in Luke's gospel. It's powerful and it challenges our own attitudes and it, it causes us to think, are, are we overlooking those who might be responsive to the gospel? Are we, are we judging people inappropriately? Uh, are we putting people in categories that maybe we shouldn't? Are, are we uh, perhaps unaware of some of our own prejudices? And let's look at Luke's gospel and let's, let, let's look anew at Luke and Acts and see how God is speaking to us and how the Lord is challenging us, rebuking us, shaping us so that we can be the means in the hands of Christ we can be the instrument to reach out to those on the fringes and show they're included in this invitation. They're included in the calling of God to receive the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow, what a beautiful and powerful thing. I hope that blesses you. I look forward to when we can be together. Hopefully that will be soon. And until then, may God bless and keep you, dear brother or sister. Mm-mm.